Well, good morning. It's great to be with you here this morning as uh, the kids are uh, dismissed to their classrooms. Um, I'd like to uh, just give a shout out to the teachers. So grateful for the teachers who have prepared a lesson today uh, for the kids. Uh, they do an amazing job. They really do a wonderful job, and, uh, and they're faithful to do it and, uh, and to study and to prepare, and uh, our kids get to benefit from that. And so I'm just thankful for them. This morning, um, this hour, the kids will be uh, in the book of Ruth, learning about how God is sovereign to bless his people. What a great message for our kids to hear and to understand. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to ask uh, him to bless our kids, and as well as the teachers, and then uh, help us this morning. <clears throat> Father God, I come before you, and I uh, thank you that uh, we get to gather together today and to worship you and to hear from your word, Lord, and the kids, as they go to their classrooms, they get to um, just glean from the, the studies of the teachers and, and, and the messages that they've prepared. Uh, we just thank you for that, Lord. And I just pray, God, that, um, that you help us, help all of us, whether we're down here or, or up there and, and upstairs. I pray that you help us to um, be softened, our hearts, um, to be ready to hear your word, ready to learn and to grow ready to be uh, confronted with our sin, ready to be challenged and convicted, and, uh, but also uh, encouraged, Lord. I pray that uh, for those who need comfort this morning, that they are comforted, and for those who need to be challenged, that they're challenged, and, and for those who need understanding, I pray that you give understanding, Lord. And especially as we talk about unity this morning from Philippians 2, I pray that you, you help us to consider this, Consider what your scriptures say, to take it to heart and to be changed by it um, and, to grow, um, and to grow in it. Again, we just thank you for this time that we have to glorify you and I just pray that that's exactly what we do this morning, that you are honored and glorified in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, it is great to be with you this morning. It's been a few months since I've had uh, uh, the opportunity to preach. So it's great to be up here uh, and, uh, and in the Word with you this morning. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, so if turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> and as you do this, I want to start with a question. Do Christians fight? <clears throat> well, I hope you know this by now, but Christians fight, don't they? Christian members fight, deacons fight, elders fight. And uh, when a fight takes place, it's usually about something petty. Someone thinks something should go one way, and another thinks it should go another way. And battle lines are drawn, and a battle ensues. I found an article online <clears throat> this week that compiled some of the most you know, petty arguments and schisms churches have faced. And I, I'd love to share a few of my favorites. Um, number one is an argument over the appropriate length of the worship pastor's beard. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. How long was it, though? I mean, I guess. <clears throat> Number two, a church dispute over whether or not to install restroom stall dividers in the women's restroom. Yeah, you guys thought our restrooms were bad. <laughs> Number three, a church argument and vote to decide if a clock in the worship center should be removed. A petition to have all staff clean-shaven. A fight over whether or not to sing happy birthday each week. A disagreement, I love this one, a, di a disagreement over using the term potluck instead of pot blessing. <laughs> <clears throat> and this one's my favorite, a, dis a dispute over whether the worship leader should have his shoes on during service. <laughs> I vote yes on that. <clears throat> The point is this, unity can be threatened by almost anything. Uh, people can sometimes be so stubborn about their preferences and desires that they're willing to sacrifice their relationships and the peace of their church to get what they want. But is there a better way? Uh, is, is this what God wants for the church? And that was, that's what we're going to be looking at here in Philippians chapter 2. Let's read the verse or read the scripture to together. Philippians chapters two, starting in verse one. 
So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. <clears throat> Well, this morning we're going to see that Paul provides three characteristics of Christian unity so that we may be humbly unified in Christian love. Three characteristics of Christian unity so that we may be humbly unified in Christian love. <clears throat> and it begins with the motive. The motive. Look there again at verse 1. It says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord in one mind. Motivation is an important part of human experience. We don't simply just, just do things just because. Uh, we do things because we're motivated. Whether you're motivated to sin or motivated to do something good, the reality is your heart motivation drives your actions. Therefore, Paul uh, seeks to properly motivate the Philippians and by extension, to motivate us to pursue Christian unity. That's what, uh, that's what he seeks to do this morning. And he starts with our mutual encouragement in Christ. He says, if there is any encouragement in Christ. If there is. Um, does Paul not know if they've been encouraged in Christ? You know, in our, our English language here, it might seem like Paul isn't sure if he, or, or maybe he has doubts, but he, he does, that he does uh, 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 about their encouragement, but that's not what's going on here. In our English language, this might seem like Paul isn't sure, but here in the Greek, the construction is what's called a, a first-class conditional, which indicates the assumption of truth for the sake of argument. It could really be translated as, since there is encouragement in Christ. You see, Paul has no question about the encouragement that we have in Christ. You see, if you're a believer here this morning, our encouragement in Christ is a reality. It is. Who wouldn't be encouraged? What's not to be encouraged by? Romans 8, uh, 31 through 32 says, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also give him gracious, or also with him graciously give us all things? God gave his only son on our behalf, not because of anything we did, but because he's gracious. And if God graciously gave his own son, is there anything that you need that he won't give to you? Furthermore, is there anyone who can come against you or to condemn you or to separate you from the love and forgiveness of God? No. Because of Christ, what a beautiful promise we have in Christ. Friend, is there any encouragement in Christ? It's not rhetorical. Go ahead. Yes. But he goes on. He says, any comfort from love. I'm not just encouraged by the, the blessings and benefits of being in Christ, but I'm also comforted by his love. He not only keeps me secure, but he loves me. Despite my sin, despite my utter, utter inability to completely worship and adore him the way that he ought to be worshipped and adored, he still loves me. If you're in Christ this morning, he loves you. People will fail you. People will hurt you. 
People will sin against you. People will betray you. The world will hate you, but he loves you. And he loves you when you fail, and he loves you when you succeed, and he loves you when he disciplines you, and when he blesses you. His love always remains. Again, there's, there's nothing more precious than this truth. He loves you. Is there any comfort in this love? Yes. yes. Next he says, any participation in the Spirit. The word participation is a Greek word that uh, many of you might be familiar with. It's koinonia. And uh, here, the ESV translates it as per, uh, participation, but if you have an NASB, it translates it as fellowship. And, and to me, fellowship makes more of a natural sense, but that doesn't really change the reading. The idea is, is that we have a common fellowship in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> that is, because of the Holy Spirit in us, we are unavoidably linked together, both in our common bond and in our common mission. You have the Holy Spirit, I have the Holy Spirit, we have the, the Holy Spirit in us, and this unifies us because there's only one Holy Spirit. This is what Paul is, is talking about in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13. He says, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. It's a, a beautiful, wonderful thing that we have. You and I and every believer around the world are united together by this common truth. We share something that the rest of the world cannot know. They don't understand. God has graciously given us his spirit not only to help us and comfort us and lead us but to unify us. Paul says in, in Ephesians 4, like Pastor Jason read this morning, that we need to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called into, uh, to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One commentator writes, together we share in the life, fruit, insight, power, and gifts of the Spirit. It's wonderful. Friends, do we have fellowship in the Spirit? Yeah, we do. Finally, he says, any affection and sympathy. The word affection has to do with emotions. So not just do you tolerate one another, uh, do you feel strongly for one another? Do you like being together? Do you miss one another? This is an important motivation for unity because if you don't feel anything for the people around you, you're not gonna care if you hurt them. I remember when <clears throat> we were planning to move from Reno to Southern California for seminary. I had, I had been a youth pastor for about six years and it was uh, before we actually moved. I, I drove down by myself to attend an event at the school for new students and to, and to also look for a job. And I remember leaving town and, and kind of crossing that threshold of town. And uh, a wave of emotion just came over me. It was, it was so real. I, I, I was leaving the kids and the families that I had poured my life into for so many years. And I just started crying. I mean, crying is an understatement. I mean, I was, I was blubbering. Uh, it, it probably wasn't safe because I couldn't see the road very well. Uh, the emotions were powerful. I, I, I loved them intensely, and I knew that they loved me, and it was, it was a powerful bond that was hard to separate. And I, and I would say this. I, I feel that way for you as well. I am so thankful to be a part of this church. I'm so thankful that I get to spend my weeks finding ways to love you and ways to teach you and counsel you and build the ministries of this church. It's what a, what a privilege it is, and I, and I love it, and I love you. I have affection for you, and I know you have affection for me and my family, and you have affection for one another, and, and that comes from the Lord. But not only affection, it, it talks about sympathy here. 
Do you have sympathy? Do you have compassion? When one of us hurts, do you hurt? The answer is yes. We all face various trials and difficulties. Sometimes we get beat up by the world or face the pain of uh, pain or, or horrifying loss. But as the church, we don't just stand by and say, ah, man, it stinks to be you. No, we don't. We're linked together. When, when you feel pain, I feel pain. When I feel pain, you feel pain. We sympathize with one another and seek to alleviate the pain as much as possible while pointing each other to our great God who also sympathizes with our weaknesses. So, do we have affection and sympathy? Yes, we do. All of these speak of our unity with Christ. Encouragement in Christ, comfort from love, participation in the spirit, affection and sympathy. We have all of these because we're unified in Christ. They're the natural results of a changed life by Christ. What should uh, should motivate, motivate us to pursue Christian unity? Look at what we have in Christ. Look at the blessing it is to be a child of God. Paul says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, which there is, any comfort from love, which there is, any participation in the Spirit, which there is, any affection and sympathy, which there is. He says, look at what you have, encouragement, love, affection, and sympathy. And his point is, don't goof it up. Don't start acting contrary to these things. Look at what's at stake. Be motivated by these things. The the precious gifts that we have in the church, be motivated by them to pursue unity. Now, but before we move on, it seems appropriate to address any of you who don't have these things. If you're not a believer here this morning, do you see what you're missing? Do you see what could be Do you see that Christ offers the forgiveness of sins, the love of God, the fellowship of the the Spirit, and affection and compassion? It's all through Jesus. It's all through his work on the cross. And you can know that forgiveness. You can take part in these incredible blessings. But it's only through Jesus Christ alone who lived a perfect, sinless life and died on a cross as a sacrifice for sins. And if you repent of your sins and put your faith in him, you get to be a part of his family. Let me tell you, and that's when you come alive. That's when there's, there's finally true living hope. Your sins are forgiven and you're given the gift of new spiritual life. But again, it's only found in Jesus. It isn't found in your vain pursuits of the world's goods. Peace and hope are only found in Jesus Christ. And I'd urge you today, if you're hearing him speak to your soul this morning, turn from your sin and trust in him. Join the family. Amen? So we see here the motive of Christian unity. Next, we're going to look at the method of Christian unity. That is, how do we pursue Christian unity? And we'll see that it isn't by force. Look at verse 2. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What we see here is that Christian unity comes through humility. And Paul begins by prefacing this long command with a a personal appeal. He says, complete my joy. Don't get this wrong. Paul isn't putting himself at the center of these things. Uh, He's not saying it's all about me. I just, I need to be happy. No. Remember, Paul is addressing the Philippians' concern for uh, his welfare. That's why he wrote the letter. They are concerned about him, and so he writes about them to address that. He had been in prison for preaching the gospel and he writes to tell them that we can all rejoice in in what God is doing whether he is in prison or whether he's free. So Paul encourages them and reminds them to rejoice, but he also wants them to know 
what would put his joy over the top? And that, and that is that they would be striving together. That, that they would be benefited and blessed and, and Paul would get to rejoice in that. And this is how they would bring Paul joy. By being of the same mind. In other words, being unified. <clears throat> Now, before we go on, we need to talk about what this does not mean. First, unity is not uniformity, okay? We're not a bunch of clones of one another. We are the body of Christ, and we all have different functions. We all have different personalities and past experiences. You can't insist that everyone thinks exactly like you. You have to embrace the differences of those around around you. God created them and he loves them, and he wants them to be the person that God created them to be. So with that, let me give you two encouragements about that. First, don't try to be someone you're not, or try to live up to someone else's arbitrary standards, okay? Your, your job as a, as a believer is to grow in holiness, and grow in your love and commitment to others, but to be you while doing it. Second, don't get frustrated with others who think like, who don't think like you uh, or, or don't move at your same pace. It's easy to get mad at someone who's just wired differently. So don't. Don't. Okay. Now what else is unity not? Well, it doesn't mean that everyone is a pushover or a yes man. Unity is not preserved by the spineless This is how you get a single strong personality that takes over the church. We need strong leaders, but it can never be about the leader and his style or personality. This is why we need a team of elders leading the church that we are all, and and that's what we do, we are all equal and we don't do anything unless we are all agreed. This protects from one individual assuming all of the decisions and enforcing his will. Additionally, unity doesn't mean that we attempt to be some kind of all-inclusive unity that embraces bad doctrines. It's kind of what the liberal churches attempt to do. They attempt to expand the Christian umbrella to include aberrant heresies um, for the sake of unity. The Philippian church learned directly from Paul, and their unity in doctrine is assumed here. Paul is not talking about a faux unity where we overlook major doctrinal disagreements. No, we must be united in doctrine. However, this doesn't mean that everyone has to have the same opinion or position as you. Sometimes people will disagree with you. Sometimes they will see an issue in a different way. And and that doesn't exclude the possibility of unity. Some of you don't agree 100% with all of my positions. But even though you're wrong, uh, we can still be unified. You know I'm joking, but, but it, it, it's true. There, there's areas where we differ, but, but it's the height of arrogance to insist that every position or opinion that you take is one to be divided over. No, if it's a matter of settled doctrine, we can... Uh, if it's not, I should say, a matter of settled doctrine, we can agree to disagree and we can maintain our unity. It's okay. So here's the reality. God has made each of us unique. Uh, We all have different dispositions and abilities. Here's the thing. It might bother some of you. That, That truth might bother some of you. You may wish everyone felt, thought, and dreamt exactly like you. But if that's your attitude, you will be disappointed. But even more than that, you're missing the beauty of the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul uses the illustration of a body to make this point. Listen to what he says. He says, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, what would not, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, 
God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So he uses this illustration of a body and different members and how we serve the body differently. But here, here's another illustration. You can think of the church as a mosaic. You know what a mosaic is? It's a, it's a picture or pattern produced by arranging together small uh, colored pieces of hard material such as stone, tile, or glass. And uh, the church is like a, a mosaic of broken shards of pottery. And, and, and we are like those broken shards of pottery that God has picked up, that he's cleaned off, and he's placed in exactly the right spot in his kingdom, okay? You, you and I are just a worthless piece of broken pottery, but God saved you, he redeemed you, he sanctified you, and he has you right where you are to serve your part in that mosaic. And God doesn't make ugly things. The church, as he has fitted it together, is beautiful to him. In fact, he, he refers to the church as his bride. And she is beautiful and precious to him. And we each have our part. We each have our place in the body, in the church, in that beautiful mosaic that God has constructed. So now we understand that we are all different, and yet we are all part of a single body. Let's get back to the text here. Paul says, complete my joy by being of the same mind. The, the sameness of mind, again, is not uniformity or, um, or being a clone, um, but unity of purpose, okay, unity of purpose. And that purpose is to glorify God. And, and this is the clu- conclusion of what God is doing in the world. We'll talk about Christ and all he did in humility in a moment, but jump down to verse 10 there. Look at the, the conclusion of this section. It says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the supreme goal. It's, it, was, it was God's goal for the incarnation, and it's his goal for the church. That God would be glorified. So what does same-mindedness look like? Paul gives us three positive characteristics and two negative. First, he says, having the same love. In other words, embracing the same love. Uh, That love that you and I experience in Christ, the wonderful love of God that transcends our sin and offers grace, that's what binds us together. Colossians 3.14, and above all these put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. The love of God is a unifying love. It's a love that overcomes our differences and binds us together. Without love, there's no unity. And uh, when there is a lack of unity, it's always due to a lack of love. Please hear that. Okay? Please hear that. Unity and love are inseparably linked. That's what the scriptures teach. When you find yourself in a conflict, know that there is a love issue in the mix every time. And know this, the Bible commands that we love one another and the Bible commands that we maintain unity. It's not an option, it's a command. So our hearts are linked, but we're also united in our endeavors. Paul says, being in full accord and in one mind. So that is, we are in agreement working in harmony towards the same goals. And again, Paul uh, is not saying that we have to agree in every detail, but as believers set apart according to the will of God, we must be united in working for his good pleasure. The ultimate goal, as I mentioned earlier, is to bring glory to God. 
And we do this as we dwell in unity and love, strengthening the body of Christ and reaching the lost. Again, we are unified in love and we bring glory to God when we strengthen the body of Christ and when we reach the lost. We need to be moving in the same direction for the glory of God. So Paul encourages us to have the same mind through love and works, but Paul also gives some negative characteristics. <clears throat> These are threats to unity. Look at verse three. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. First he says, do nothing from selfish ambition. The selfishly ambitious destroy unity. Again, the selfishly ambitious destroy unity. If I'm only looking out for number one and trying to promote number one, I'm not acting in love perfect example of this I think we can all think of like a slimy politician right you know a person who's not really trying to benefit the country but but seeking power and money or fame for themselves you know we can all understand that That, that's kind of the epitome of, of selfish ambition but here's the thing we all have the tendency to position and promote ourselves above others we all do this is, this is the problem of the human heart. We naturally consider our wants and desires more important than others. It's a, a problem of the human heart. So we fight for position and it can cause us to do some pretty nasty stuff. James warns, James warns about this in, in chapter four. He says, what ca- causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. This is such an important concept. And, and, and here's the thing. If you've tuned out for some reason at this point, I want you to come back to me, okay? Come back and, and listen to this point, okay? Don't tune out. When you fight and quarrel, it's revealing something about your heart, When you fight and quarrel, it is revealing something about your heart. It's your commitment to your own agenda. You are harboring sin and idolatry in your heart. When you fight and quarrel, there is sin involved. Always. Always. When you push people away and refuse to reconcile, there is sin involved. When you are angry at your brother or sister, there is sin involved. When you are in conflict, it is a sin issue. And Paul gives us this warning. He says, do nothing, right? That it, and, and what he's saying is, it, it's not just when I get into a conflict that it's a problem. No, my attitude must be one of alertness. Ask yourself, how am I prone to selfishness and how can I do the opposite? I've got to ask my heart those questions. I want to be proactive in maintaining unity and it starts with my own heart. It starts at looking at my own motivations and the own, my own sin that wants to creep up and out and spill onto others and cause division and destruction and pain wants to divide and destroy because I want what I want. So, don't let your desires become controlling wants and desires. You have to be alert. What is it that you want more than peace? What is it that you want more than unity? The other unity killer is conceit. Some of your translations might uh, might say empty conceit or vain glory. And and the nuance is an exaggerated self-evaluation. To think of yourself higher than you ought to think. Right, of course, this is the root of selfish ambition. Thinking of yourself 
more highly than you ought. So what do we do? <clears throat> How do we combat the destructive nature of our own selfishness? Look again there, verse three. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. It's hard, isn't it? It is. It, it takes humility and love, and humility is hard. It, it's exactly the opposite of the natural dispositions of our heart. Someone once said, humility is a strange thing. As a rule, once you discover you have it, you lose it. There's a story of Henry Ironside who pastored Moody Church in Chicago about 95 years ago. He tells the story of a time when he was concerned that he wasn't as humble as he ought to be. And so his, his friend suggested that Ironside wear, uh, get a large sandwich board and, and wear it uh, put some scriptures uh, written down on it and walk through downtown Chicago shouting the scripture verses on the board for all to hear. And so Ironside did as his friend suggested and when he returned to his apartment humbled by the experience, he caught himself thinking, I'll bet there's not another person in Chicago that would be willing to do a thing like that. We are naturally bent to think well of ourselves. We just are. By nature, we are self-favoring. We love ourselves. We think highly of ourselves, and we, we fail to see our sin for what it is. Sure, we can see other people's sin really well, very clearly, but we fail to see just how corrupt our own hearts are. We are self-favoring, and, and in this way, we are self-deceived. It's when we examine ourselves in the light of Scripture and see that we, we really are wretched to the core, that's when we're humbled. My, my propensity to sin is astounding. I, I'm utterly weak. Nothing good comes from me. It's only by the grace of God that I'm not as bad as I could be. And it's when I recognize the utterly disgusting motives of my heart that I can put that junk away and cling to the cross for help. And that's when I can count others as more significant than myself, when I see my sin for what it really is, when I see the operation of sin in my life, when I see it working to cause division, when I see it working to cause pain in my family or home or in the church or with my friends or with anybody, I have to be humbled. And that's the high calling of the believer to humble ourselves and to put others first. The only way true unity can exist is, is if you put away the self-centered, self-favoring old nature and put on an attitude of true humility where you decide in your mind to think of others as more important than yourself. Now look at verse four. <clears throat> Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. A healthy church is one where the members look out for one another and promote the interests of others. It's assumed that you're gonna look out for your own interests. You, you usually won't do things that will intentionally harm yourself. But do you take that same care to look out for others? That's the question. The verb in, in this verse is scopeo, and it means to pay careful attention to. And I think of it like this. It's like when you watch a small child around a body of water, okay? Even if it's not your child, you, you're, you're kind of zoned in and ready to leap into action if they fall in. You guys, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? We, it's in that same way. We must, we must carefully consider others. Watch out for one another. Every member of the congregation should take personal responsibility for attending to the interests of others in the congregation rather than being consumed with our own interests. Consider the impact that you have on others, whether good or bad. However, <clears throat> I would caution you against utilitarianism, okay? And that's the mentality that says the end, ends justifies the means. This is how church splits happen, 
okay? That is when uh, faction lines are drawn and one side is willing to sacrifice relationships and unity for the greater good. Maybe a, a unity later on down the road. If only we could just get rid of this group, then we'll be unified. In other words, you justify your sinful actions today because you think that you're right and that you will, it'll turn into something good later. Don't be deceived. God calls us to unity, church. He calls us to work together for the good of the kingdom and the advancement of the gospel. Don't get it in your head that you will accomplish these things apart from dwelling in unity. We have to dwell in unity. We have to be united in our love for the Lord and our love for one another. It's a bad witness to the world and God will not bless it if we move ahead of those things and discount the importance of unity. It's not the model that we see in Christ, which we will look at right now. So again, we've seen the motivation, we know the method, and now let's look at the model of Christian unity. The model. Look at verse five. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father." The model of Christian unity is Christ. He, he's the greatest example of what it means to consider the interests of others. The truest of humility on display. Paul says, though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. This is a wonderful statement about Jesus' divinity. Paul's not talking about Jesus' shape or visual form. He's talking about his being He was in the form of God. He's talking about his godness. Hebrews 1.3 says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And I like what one commentator writes about that. He says, note that Christ is not a mere reflector of God's glory. He is the radiance, the one who radiates the glory of God. He shines forth his own essential glory along with that of the Father and the Spirit in the mystery of the Trinity. This is who he is. Jesus is God. And in no way was he obligated by anything or anyone to become a man and die on the cross. He could have remained as he was. But instead, it says he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, here's the thing. Don't don't misunderstand this. Jesus is equal with God. He, He never stopped being equal with God. It's saying here that he didn't hold on to his equality with God as something to use for his own advantage. It wasn't something that he needed to hold on to for himself. The pre incarnate Christ gladly humbled himself by becoming a man. Look again at verse 6 there. It says, who though he is in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. <clears throat> he emptied himself and became a servant. This is a, one of those hotly debated uh, verses in the Bible. What does it mean that he emptied himself? Growing up I was taught that it meant that Jesus emptied himself of his divine attributes. You know, it was taught that he, you know, left his tool belt in heaven and became a man. And and this is kind of the kenosis theory. But it's really important that we take note of the fact that that Paul doesn't say anything about Jesus' divine attributes in this passage. It, It says he emptied himself. It doesn't say what he emptied himself of, okay? When Jesus became a man, he didn't lose his divinity, It's impossible for God to cease being God. Uh, God cannot be divided, stretched, or emptied. When the Son of God became man, it was an addition, not a subtraction. Okay, he added a human nature. 
However, it's also important to note that he is not part God and part man or or some kind of God-man hybrid. No, he is both fully God and fully man. And I know it's, it's, that's kind of confusing, um, and this is why it was uh, hammered out in the, in the historic creeds of our faith. Um, the early church wrestled with this, right? And so I'd encourage you to read the Nicene Creed and the Chalcedonian Creed. Um, really, you, you should read that. If you've never read it, you should read those, uh, because they did. They hammered these things out. They really thought deeply about these things, um, and we do find them helpful, Again, the Nicene Creed and the Chalcedonian Creed. Um, so, and they're, they're not long. They're, they're short. So, I encourage you to read that. So, what is Paul saying? The NIV is, is helpful here. He, he made himself nothing is what it says. Uh, this captures the, this, this, it, it captures the idea that Paul is, is shooting for and completes the illustration that Paul's making. Uh, Though he's God, he became man. Actually, a, a servant, which is far beneath what God, what, what is expected of God. Paul is helping us understand the, the condescension of God. That, that being God, he would take upon himself a human nature is incomprehensible. He condescended, he came down as a stunning act of humility. He made himself Nothing. He made himself a man. But not only did he become a man, he took the form of a servant. <clears throat> Even sinful men struggle to serve other sinful men. But here you have the perfect God incarnate serving sinful men. The perfect example of this is when Jesus gets down to wash the disciples' feet in John 13. And they, they were indignant when he did this. Because even for a Jewish servant, this was considered humiliating. And yet Jesus teaches them an important lesson by this. He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do, just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. What amazing humility we have in our Lord. That God would come down to serve, and again, to serve sinful men. But this wasn't even Jesus' greatest act of humility. Look there at verse eight. It says, in being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So not only did Jesus model humble servitude, but he humbled himself to the greatest degree when he died on a Roman cross. Think about the death that he endured. In in today's day and age, there's great debate over the ethics of having a death penalty, and and even those who are condemned to die, such care is taken to, to make sure that it's the most humane way possible, right? For Jesus, there was nothing humane about it. To die on a cross was a shameful way to die. This is why Paul says, even death on a cross. Or we should say, even death on a cross. It's one thing for Jesus to become a man. It's another thing for him to become a servant. And it's quite another thing for him to die. But to die on a cross was the most scandalous of all deaths. It was a degrading experience. He, he was beaten almost to death, stripped naked, nailed to these wooden beams and exposed to the elements while the life drained out of his body for hours. And all of this while people spit, yelled, and mocked him. Do you see what lengths Jesus went to save us? Paul mentions his obedience. Jesus did go willingly to the cross, but He was not undertaking this mission alone. He was sent by God the Father and empowered by the Holy Spirit. He took on human flesh and he went to the cross out of obedience to the Father. You guys all know John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus testifies several times that it was the Father who sent him. 
And in the garden, just before he was to be crucified, he prays to the Father and he asks if it be his will to take the cup away from him. But he says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus modeled humble submission. He obeyed all that God commanded him to do. And this is important for us as well. God has called us to walk in humility, to walk in humble unity. We're called to prefer others above ourselves and to look out for the interests of others. But we struggle with this, don't we? There are times when we don't follow God's commands and unity is broken. There are times when we question whether resolving a conflict is really that important. I mean, if it gets me what I want, right? And we ignore God's clear word that, that, uh, to, to instead, uh, or we ignore God's word and, and instead trust our own wisdom. This is a call to humility, church. A humility demonstrated by Jesus Christ when he laid down his life in obedience to the Father so that we may be forgiven and join in the unity Jesus shares with the Father and the Spirit. Make no mistake, our unity is important to Jesus. It's very important. In John 17, Jesus prays to the Father asking him to unify us. He says that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Unity and working out our differences is a big deal. It's a big deal. It's important to God. It's God's desire for us. Don't allow your pride to break up the sweet fellowship that we have here in Christ. Or even in your home. Or with your kids. Or at work or whatever it is. Don't allow your pride to to cause conflict and division. There's too much at stake. We have to be an example to the world. We have to be pulling in the same direction. Matter of fact, let's look at the end of this passage. Paul explains why Jesus did what he did, the the purpose of it all. Look there in verse nine. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here we have the the culmination of all things, the goal of all history so that God would be glorified in the exaltation of Jesus. At the completion of his mission, Jesus ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And Paul reminds us of this. He reminds us that that God has highly exalted him. God has exalted the Son in the most magnificent way possible. Notice the path here. Jesus went from being in divine glory to becoming a man and dying in the most despicable way imaginable in the ancient world and now being lifted up and exalted to the most glorious position. But not only is he honored and exalted, God has bestowed on him the name that is above every name. What is this mysterious name? Look at verse 11. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. This speaks of Jesus' ultimate sovereign authority over all creation. He is Lord. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's to be obeyed as such. And this is what we will see at the end. A time is coming when everyone looks to Jesus and recognizes him as the true king of kings. But not only will everyone recognize him as Lord, but they will bow to him as Lord. Every knee in heaven, earth, and under the earth will bow. But not only will they bow, they will confess him as Lord. This includes everyone who has ever lived. It's it's interesting that even those who refuse to bow their knee and confess today will do so at the end. 
everyone, all people will give an account and all people will be humbled in the presence of Jesus. We see this in Revelation 20. It says uh, in verses 11 through 13, then I saw a great white throne and him who seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in, who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. This day is coming. Are you ready? All will acknowledge him as Lord, but it's, it's only the redeemed that will do so with joy as their name is read from the book of life. But what a terrifying day for those who never put their faith in Jesus. If that's you this morning, it, 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 it's your unforgiven sin that will condemn you. <clears throat> but there's hope and there's life that's offered to you today. Turn from your sin and put your faith in Jesus and you will be forgiven of your sin. Confess with your mouth today that Jesus is Lord and ask him to save you. And if you do, you will be brought into the family of God and take part in our unity. Amen? For the rest of you, remember how important our unity is. Consider the heart of Jesus who who prayed for us to be unified. Consider Paul who urged the Philippians to be unified. But above all, consider the example that Christ has set for us. Unity comes through humility. And and Jesus was the ultimate example. He laid down his life for us so that we, and now we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Amen? Yeah. I thought it would be fitting before I close to to read our church covenant because this is one of the ways uh, we can be of the same mind, having the same love and being in full accord and of one mind. So <clears throat> I'm gonna read this. I want you just to listen for our commitment to unity um, as it's found in the church covenant. So here it goes. Having been led, as we believe, by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another, as one body in Christ. We commit, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of the church in all knowledge and holiness, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also commit to maintain family and personal worship, to train our children in reverence for and in admonition of the Lord, to educate our children in Bible truths, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk cautiously in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our lives, to abstain from anything which might have the appearance of evil or cause a brother to stumble, or to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of God. We further commit to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and courtesy in speech, to be slow to take offense but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. We moreover commit that when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. Let's pray. Father God, what a high calling we have as your people to dwell in humble unity. Lord, unity is a fragile thing. It can be gone in an instant. And I pray that you help us, that you bind us together by the power of your spirit, that we would love one another, care for one another, serve one another, and consider one another as more important than ourselves. Help us, Lord. Help us to look at one another with eyes of of affection and sympathy. Help us to to find ways to, to look out for one another. Lord, again, just bind us together in your love. 
I pray that you help us to, to resist division, to resist the sin in our heart that wants to bubble up to the surface and, and cause the destruction that it wants to cause. I pray that you help us to smack it down in your name, to be committed to unity and love. Lord, help us. We need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Allow me to leave you with these final words from John 17, <clears throat> verses 20 through 21. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. May you walk in humility this morning so that we all may be one in Jesus Christ. God bless you as you go.